This is a tutorial on the seller financing addendum and disclosure. This is form SFA. Now I'll take you through this form, but there's an alternative way to add seller financing to a purchase agreement. I actually wouldn't use this form. I would do it a different way and I'll show you the other way to do it after we go through this form because of course we need to go through this form so you know how to use it if you decide to, but either way will work. All right, so we start by, well, if by default, this is part of the purchase agreement, so we don't have to check any boxes here. Now, if this is added on during the counter offer, you might check this, that you're adding this to a counter offer, but I would say leave this alone and then write in the date of the purchase agreement, top left corner of page one of the purchase agreement, property address, names of the parties, and then we get right into the terms. Now I put some sample information here. We have a loan amount of 500,000. So the seller is going to be carrying back 500K in this scenario at an interest rate of 7%, which is probably low for seller financing nowadays. But of course, this rate is negotiable between the parties. And then I put a monthly payment, an interest only payment of 29.17, which is 7% of 500K divided by 12 months. And that's how I arrive at this payment per month. Now, of course, you could do a principal and interest payment. You can do whatever you want, whatever the parties want, and then just get an amortization calculator out. But most of the time, seller financing is a short-term loan between two and five years. And here I put three years that the remaining balance of this is due. And that's typically because the buyer will refinance with an institutional lender, freeing up that seller of holding on to that loan. Or maybe the buyer is expecting selling their property and having some cash and then paying off the seller. Either way, typically the seller doesn't sit around waiting decades to be paid back all their money. That's why these are short term. And there's another provision down there that will reconnect on this point. Now loan application credit report, you could just leave this as a default five days for the buyer submitting documentation of their credit worthiness. If you do nothing here, that's fine. If you want to shorten it, you of course can put it here, shorten or lengthen it. I would just leave it alone. I don't even know why I checked this box here when I created this sample. All right, credit documents. Now this is important because with seller financing, a note and deed of trust are, are integral to the process. And the reason is that the note is going to be an expanded version of these terms. It explains everything. That's the big pile of loan docs you get when you're signing a signing a mortgage with an institutional lender. And the deed of trust is how you record that on title so that there's a lien that 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 collateralizes the home for that mortgage. So we're gonna check this box here. If you have questions about these other topics, I could go I could talk at length about all of them, good and bad, but that's time consuming, so we're we're not even going to touch on these. But Typically for a normal seller financing, you'll just do a note and deed of trust. If you have questions, leave a comment about these. <clears throat> All right, now we continue on. Do you wanna add a late charge? Now, so this ties into the reason why I actually prefer to do things a different way. This is, this is in my opinion, too comprehensive to just be an addendum to the purchase agreement, but it's also not comprehensive enough to be a, the, a note that a, a seller should have when they're, when they're doing financing. So if you wanna add late charge, go for it. Put in a number. It could be whatever the parties agree, or you could just add an arbitrary number like I did, five days after it's late, 5%, whatever, whatever you want. But the thing is that this, in my opinion, should be used more as a, a draft similar to a letter of intent, where you're stating a list of terms of what you'd like to see on a note, but this isn't the final product. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer a different method to do this, but we're gonna continue on. So if there's a late charge, put a late charge in there. If there's not, I would say, or if you're unsure, I would say leave a blank, and I'll explain why at the end of this. Okay, balloon payment. Now, this again is a balloon payment is, is the remainder of the principal due upon conclusion of the loan term. Since we're, we're doing three years up here, I put the end of the month, actually the end of the following month, because we would be closing escrow next month, three years from now. 
So it basically says, hey, at the end of the 37th month from when I'm drafting this, this entire amount's due. But the idea, of course, before that, the buyer's refinanced with an institutional lender or inherited money or won the lottery or whatever, but somehow they're paying off this, this seller. Do you want to add a prepayment penalty? These are questions, not common by the way, but or nowadays not common, but these are questions to be decided between the parties. Ultimately, <clears throat> you shouldn't put too much pressure on yourself as an agent because it's not up to you. You're not their attorney. You're simply drafting this as a as some initial terms to put together a note. Do on sale, definitely check this. Why? Because if the buyer tries vesting ownership of that collateral, that property to someone else, they need to repay the loan or else the, the seller who is then the beneficiary of the mortgage loses the collateral. So it's very dangerous. So that's why you want to check this. Okay. Now, if now, again, this is why this forms a little bit, it, it's, it's more technical than it should be, but not technical enough to be a full-on note. But it asks here about getting copies of notices of default. Why? Because sometimes people have a second mortgage that subordinates to a first mortgage. What happens if one of the other mortgages, the buyer's in default, and then, or the owner at that point's in default, and now that, of course, that mortgage company is seeking to, they're pursuing the asset through foreclosure to get paid back. So these are just asking for copies of that. If there's a second mortgage, is there? You may not even know, but if you're in doubt, just leave this blank here, tax service. So this is more of why this is actually way more complicated than just an old fashioned, oh, seller's gonna carry back X dollars of the sale. Because the question is, who is going to ensure property taxes are paid? Because if property taxes go unpaid, now, of course, this is not very likely, but it's still possible. If property taxes go unpaid and the county seizes an asset or places some lien on an asset, property tax liens take precedent over any mortgage lien. And in theory, unpaid property taxes that go on for years, if the county seized ownership of the, of the property, the, then the those those mortgage liens get wiped away. So if you're a mortgage, if, if you are a seller that's created a mortgage for a buyer, you want to make sure that property taxes are paid, right? You don't want your collateral of this property, this asset to be jeopardized by an irresponsible homeowner. So that's why when you get a, a mortgage from Wells Fargo or, or name whatever giant lender, they're going to make sure that they, they might have your 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 property taxes impounded. They're going to make sure that you have um, a lender's title uh, insurance policy, which is why we check this box. They're going to make sure that you have homeowner's insurance because if you don't have homeowner insurance and the, and the, the collateral, the home burns down, then the mortgage lender's in big trouble. So that's why, that's why there's all these protections in notes for mortgage companies because they're just thinking, hey, this home's collateral. If anything happens to it, we're in trouble because if the home burns down and there's no home there, and then the homeowner says, I'm not paying you, well, the mortgage company's out for the money. And when a seller is doing financing, they have just signed up for all the same headaches as a big bank. But the, the difference is a big bank can take a hit now and then because they're so large and they're operating at scale. A seller that's taking a mortgage can't afford to. If a seller is making a loan for 500K, that might be the majority of their net worth. And if something happens, the home burns down and there's no property insurance, then guess what? That asset's gone. The buyer's not, the buyer slash owner's not going to pay them and they have no home they can foreclose on and sell to regain their, their, their money. So that's why all these provisions in here are to protect both parties and make sure that the that the home, the collateral, nothing happens to it. All right, so we check these boxes. Tax service, I would just say, this can get complicated. I would leave it blank, actually, unless that you there are going to be taxes impounded. Who's going to service that mortgage? How is the buyer going? Is the buyer going to write a personal check? Is the buyer going to do auto pay. I mean, these, these are actually questions that, that truly should be answered in a proper document. Again, another reason why I prefer not to use this and to do it a different way. And I just actually did a large seller carry back transaction in September. So I've done many over the years, but this, this was a large one. This was a huge one. 
All right, so uh, negative amortization, don't even bother with this. This is virtually obsolete at this point. And uh, in an extremely rare chance that you need to invoke this provision, you already know enough about it to not need me to explain it. Uh, All-inclusive deed of trust, that's a separate matter. That's different. That's if there's uh, an existing mortgage from the seller that's staying on on the title of the property. We're not talking about um, all-inclusive trust deeds on this on this uh, video. We're talking about just a simple seller carry back. So you can skip all this right there. Skip it. Now we're going to tax IDs. We check the box. Parties are going to share their tax IDs. Only natural. They now have a borrower beneficiary mortgage relationship. All right, recording, junior financing. Okay, so are there other encumbrances on here? If I was filling this out, if I had to fill this 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 SFA form, I wouldn't do this. I would I would just leave it like this. I might fill this out, probably not. Actually, unless someone insisted, I wouldn't do anything. So let's look at this whole page. We're in page two of four. I, I, with the exception of this box being checked, I wouldn't do anything on here. You don't need it. You don't need it. Parties are going to initial, but you don't need it. And then more advisory text. Okay, I'd have the party signed, and I'm done. Page three or four. That's it. That's, that's all I would do. That's all you need to do. <clears throat> and then I'll tell you what I would really do. All right, this is just talking about th there are restrictions in terms of how many transactions a, uh, a private party that doesn't engage in in uh, mortgage as their primary business can can do and this just advises on what these restrictions are all right this is an advisory party's initial four pages done okay if you do this form make sure that in your purchase agreement you incorporate the sfa let's jump over to a purchase agreement where would you do that so there's a section i'm going to scroll through this purchase agreement real quick we can add on all these different addenda and advisories, and I don't think they have one for seller financing, but you can just check a box and write other and write in SFA. That's it. It's now part of this agreement. Okay. But here's what I would do instead. I wouldn't do an SFA at all. In fact, I had a conversation with one of my agents yesterday, and I told her, don't even bother with an SFA. Here's what you do on financing, you go to loan amount, you put in the loan amount. We're pretending we're buying a place for 1 million even, just because it's a nice round number. And we're pretending that the seller is going to do a carry back, which is seller financing of $700,000 or 70% of the purchase price, okay? And we put a rate, not to exceed what? 8%. We just put whatever the rate is. Naturally, the seller is going to want the highest rate they can get so if you put not to exceed, that's going to be the rate. I mean, they're not going to say, well, you put not to exceed eight, but I'll just do five. They're going to say, what's the most I can get? You're going to say, well, here, here's my limit. So you put whatever the rate's going to be right there. Then you check this box, seller financing. Okay, right now, we've just created the terms, general terms of the loan, but it's not enough. This just tells the seller we're doing seller financing. <clears throat> but then we go down here. This agreement is subject to the execution of a mutually agreeable seller financing note. Why do we put it in here? So we just did a short note, a very short note that was coupled with several other documents that were much longer, like a guarantee, all this other stuff. But the note we did was drafted by an attorney. It was eight pages long, and it was very specific to the terms the parties wanted for a seven-figure seller carryback. And the important part is that you need a note that says what happens if there's a late payment, how many days or months go by before the seller has a remedy to foreclose. There are so many what ifs, and there are plenty of attorneys that are very well versed in this that will draft a note. For a seller to do a carryback and not have an attorney draft a note is absolutely reckless, period. The seller's taking on the position of a mortgage lender. They're taking on a lot of risk. The idea, especially in California, that you may have someone occupying a place that you have a mortgage on, and that that 
and, and, and that place is collateral to a loan that's hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars without having, without spending a little bit of money <clears throat> to have an attorney draft a proper note is absolutely insane. No matter what, even if you do, if you do the SFA, this form we just did, hand that to an attorney and say, please fix this, please fix this. This is a sketch, but you need to turn this into a beautiful oil painting. You need to have them upgrade this, this crude initial draft into a real legitimate note and prepare a deed of trust that can be recorded with the county. Now, escrow will record the deed of trust. It's part of the escrow process, but you need a note and you need to send it to escrow. All right, let's jump back here. <clears throat> so we put this in. Now there's a contingency and there should be a loan. So leave this here, 17 day loan contingency. All right, leave it because the seller's creating a loan. That's it. The seller's creating a loan when they're doing a carry back. But it's very important that we create this contingency that there much, must be a mutually agreeable note. And mutually agreeable means both parties are okay with it because no, no note should be one-sided. Now there's one last component in this because this is gonna come up. Someone's gonna say, who's attorney or how much? <clears throat> and we go down here. So you could add, by the way, if you really wanna get ahead of it, you could, you could flesh out that conversation in advance and say, whose attorney's drafting it? Or by a mutually agreeable to attorney or something to that effect, okay? Clients will probably look to you for recommendation. If you don't have a real estate attorney, you can recommend to someone. You need to find one. That's part of being an agent. You should, you should, if someone says, I need a real estate attorney, you should say this person and immediately be able to reference someone. Now, <clears throat> down here, we put this in. Seller financing legal. Okay? And I put both because the note is something that is is part it's a it's a benefit to the buyer that they're doing seller financing it's a benefit to the seller that they're actually doing something that is the proper way and being protected but of course this is negotiable who cares just whatever part the parties want to do that it's not a, it's not up to us to dictate who should do it it's up to them to tell us or help them come to an agreement of who's going to pay so we put that in here and i put seller financing legal fees because that's the next question when an attorney bills for whatever thousand thousands of dollars or whatever they they bill through escrow it depends on the attorney They're fees all over the place for this i've seen all different ra range of fees for this but <clears throat> everyone's going to look at each other like okay well who's paying that three thousand dollar legal fee to put all this together and you want to make sure it's already been decided up here and everyone's protected because this whole sale is subject to a mutually agreeable seller financing note that's it if one of the terms on there is extreme or is unsatisfactory to one of the parties, exorbitant late fee, you name it, whatever could be put on there, they can put their foot down. And if not, everyone's not happy, the agreement doesn't go forward. This is what I would do. I would only use the RPA for seller financing. And the second this gets an escrow, I'd say, all right, let's, let's get in contact with a real estate attorney that's gonna talk to you and draft a note that's mutually agreeable and the parties look at it and then they're going to sign it's going to be notarized there'll be a deed of trust it's going to be recorded and that's it if you have any questions please leave a comment thank you for watching